Hello everyone. Alright, so what we're going to do is skip around a little bit because there's one topic I want to cover in chapter one I'm going to come back to, but we're going to move into chapter two with the first of the of several different sub subtopics in that chapter, and that is units of measurement. The idea is we need to be very clear at all times exactly what we're talking about. Now, when we talked about the scientific method, one of the things that we said in all of that was we want observations. That's collecting data in scientific terminology. But <coughs> we'd like for those observations to be quantifiable. We'd like to have numbers to go with them, rather than saying, for instance, that I'm tall or I'm short. Well, those are relative terms. Depends on you. To Shaquille O'Neal, I'm short. To most people in my classes, I'm a little taller than they are. So relative measurements or relative discussions of data are not really all that good. They run us into problems very quickly because we then need those external comparisons all the time. For me to instead say that I'm six feet tall doesn't leave much for, for argument. If you're comparing that against your own height, I'm either taller or shorter than you, but we have a reference standard. And that's what units of measurement are for. They allow us, by using agreed upon reference standards, like a foot, for instance, to quantify our measurements and therefore not have to deal with relative discussions of them in every moment. So that is part of what we would like. And the second is, of course, the systems that we use. Um, the older English standard system that we still use in this country is problematic and we're going to talk about why as we go through this lecture. Um, basically the rest of the entire world uses the metric system which is what we deal with in the sciences all the time. So we're going to get you out of the idea that you need to be thinking in feet and pounds and get you into the idea that you need to be thinking in meters and kilograms. So um, first the first and one of the most important lessons I ever learned in my early science courses was from a chemistry teacher. Um, he had a policy on his exams that if you left the units off of something, um, you lost five points, even if it was only a two-point question. So it became possible to get negative scores on exams. Um, I don't do that, but I think it's still a good idea because this is really, really important that you know what scale you're talking about and what you're referring to. For instance, if I were to say to you that I am 49, well, there's a pretty easy implication on what that means, but what if you're wrong? What if I'm talking about I'm 49 feet from a stop sign? I'm 49 days from the last time I was in Paramus. Um, so the units here are important. I need to know exactly what I'm talking about. That one, of course, is implied. You all kind of have said that at some point in your life as well. It's implied that when you refer to yourself and put a number after it like that, you're talking about years since birth. But that implication doesn't work very often, and it's a bad idea to use it. If I want to be explicit about what I'm talking about, then I put a unit with it, and that's going to be the expectation for every number you ever discuss again for the rest of your life, that you're going to put a unit with it so that we know what system you're talking about, what measurement you're talking about, and that even tells us something about the tools that might have been used to make that measurement. So, um, let's get started. The English standard system that you're familiar with from living in this country um, is a very odd one. It's old, and many of the measurements in it are based on subdivisions of four, but not all of them. Some of them are based on subdivisions that don't really make proper sense. So that's part of the push toward the metric system and why it is that the sciences prefer it because the divisions there make more sense. The other is significant figures and scientific notation, two topics we're going to approach in a, a separate video after this one. Um, but let's give an example. Um, if I were to ask you how many inches are in a foot, most people would know that. It looks like this. This is a one 
equivalency we all know, or most people know. Okay. If I were to ask you how many feet are in a yard, probably you know that, but you don't use it very often. In fact, we rarely ever use it. Okay. So the next one up in our larger quantities of measurement is a mile. Well, how many feet are in a mile? And this is kind of fun in person because I can watch people's ears start to smoke as they try to remember this. Because we don't think about it. You walk in feet, you travel in miles, and basically most people don't know their relationship between the two of them. So it's a little odd. And it's one of the failings of our measurement system and one that we kind of have to deal with. Um, the correct answer is 5,280. Now, why? <laughs> um, as I said, a lot of the measurement divisions in our system are based on fours. I don't understand this one. There's no intermediate distances. Um, you know, there's uh, common usage is inches, feet, lesser common yards, and then miles. So this is a strange division, and it's one that a lot of people aren't familiar with, even though you experience it basically every time you leave your house. Ha ha, remember that? We used to leave our house. Okay, you know. Um, so we have similar problems with volume. We have similar problems um, with mass. So if we go into mass and say, all right, let's just talk about the, the three common ones. Um, how many ounces in a pound? And, you know, 16. Okay. Well, the next one up on that scale is the ton. So, how many pounds in a ton? This is what you're, for instance, if you're doing your vehicle registration, that's what they want to know. Um, if you drive a larger vehicle, you pay more for your car registration because of that. Um, and it's an odd division. Again, they're 2,000 pounds is one ton. So, again, there's no middle ground here, really. And the division is also not one that really makes sense. Um... Mass has a couple of different problems. There are different ounce measurements. There's one called the troy ounce that's used for precious metals that's closer to 12 to 1 instead of 16 to 1. Um, and ounce is also used in volume terms, but it doesn't mean the same thing. <laughs> so it's a, a strange term used in two different ways. Um, in volume, it's clarified sometimes um, that you'll get the word FL or fluid in front of it um, to tell you it's the volume measurement instead of a mass one. But again, this is not great. Um, so if you're dealing with a kit, you know, if you're dealing with a, a, a recipe for sometimes, they'll have it just written in ounces. And depending on where the cookbook is from, they could be talking about mass, they could be talking about volume, and you're not even sure which, unless it's something that's obviously a solid. Um, so it's unclear, and, it, and it's sloppy in that respect. Um, again, these are sort of divisions of four, but not all of them are. Um, for instance, um, if we talk about volume, we'd be looking at the ounce um, cup, pint, quart, and then gallon. And there's nothing above a gallon. Here we have miles that represent a large number of feet. We have tons that represent a large number of pounds. We don't have anything comparable to that in volume terms. <laughs> so we just have, if you're talking about your swimming pool volume or something, it's, you know, tens of thousands of gallons. Or, you know, in my case, it's like 50 gallons in a little plastic kiddie pool that my dog plays in. Um, so the point is we don't have the same type of subdivisions, we don't have the same type of sense, and the, the measurements in between them doesn't make complete sense. Um, so, just so we get this in our mind, 
Uh, there are eight fluid ounces in a cup. Um, there are 32 fluid ounces in a quart. And there are 128 fluid ounces in a gallon. So, mostly measurements, mostly divisions by four. Um, but, again, messy in that it's using the ounce term differently. Um, and there are others that go in here. There's a half a gallon, obviously we know what that means. There's, um, there's pint and half pint, which you really only deal with with, like, milk cartons in grade school. But... Um, these are not logical. They're they're dated and they're not logical, and they certainly don't make the math any simpler to do, uh, because your digits are changing. And again, we'll talk more about that later. But it's just not ideal in a lot of ways. Um, the the benefits of the metric system, which we're going to talk about, is that all of your conversion factors are based on ten. So rather than 12 or 3 or 5280 or 2000 or 16 or 8 or 128 they're all going to be multiples of 10 and that has a couple of benefits one it works well with scientific notation we will talk about that in a separate video um, two it doesn't change the digits um, if i convert 123 inches to feet um, the digits are going to change but if i convert 123 centimeters to meters well that digit one, two, and three are still going to be there. Metric conversions only involve changing where the decimal place is. The digits don't actually get altered, and so it makes it less likely you're going to make a mistake. It makes it easier to do some fairly simple stuff without a calculator. Um, dealing with you know conversions in our system without a calculator requires a fair amount of, of math skill that a lot of people don't have. So. Um, it takes some practice to get used to, whereas the metric system is easier to learn and it's easier to work with. Unfortunately, in most cases, you're learning it instead of at six years old, you're learning it at 20 years old. Um, so it's not quite as clear and you've spent a lot of time with another system. So it's the difference between, for instance, people who learn two languages at home as children and people who try to learn a second language in college. One of them is going to be really good at it, the other one rarely gets very good at a second language. So the, the system of measurement is exactly the same. The sciences without fail use the metric system for everything. Basically this lecture is the only time I ever discuss English measurements unless I'm giving somebody directions and just say okay it's 10 miles down the road. That's it. I never use the English system for anything um, and that's the way the sciences work. All scientific measurements are taken in metric measurements, metric units, and all those conversions are a lot easier. So, here we are. Um, this is a slide showing you a lot of the pieces of the things that we measure and deal with quite commonly. Um, that we have, we can talk about things in inches or in meters or pounds, kilograms, um, miles and kilometers are comparable and we have a different temperature scale as well. That conversion is the only one that's fairly complicated because it requires formulas. We have basically five things that we talk about units and measurement on. They are volume, length, mass, temperature, and time. Time is the only one that is not altered. There is no separate time unit in the metric system. It's exactly the same. Um, we basically stole that from the ancient Babylonians because that's where the base 60 number system began. So 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and then the 360 uh, degrees in a circle. All of that stuff comes from, you know, very very ancient history so that's where those numbers actually come from but um, we will deal with metric divisions if we're talking about something that's really fast we'll talk about it in milliseconds or a thousandth of a second so we will still use metric work with time even though there's no metric time unit it's the same time unit regardless of which system we're using for all the other measurements all right so um, the idea again is that we want to agreed upon standards um, the metric system is more formally known as the International System of Units, SI, because it's French, Système International. Um, the idea is that that is the metric system, 
So it's how we deal with our experiments, it's how we do our measurements, it's the system that we agreed upon, it has standards that make more sense, um, that are kept in a museum in France, I believe. Um, but the point is, this is where we are in the sciences and where we're going to be all the time. If you grew up with the metric system, a fair number of you in my class probably did, then I apologize for boring you. You're the exception, not the rule. For the rest of us that grew up in this country, um, basically we learned inches and feet and heard about centimeters and meters you know in high school when we took our first real science classes and it probably didn't even stick then so okay now technically the SI system is the metric system but it's a metric system based off of specific standards so you can see there's some slight differences here um, the meter is the same in both um, the second of course is the same in both there is a standard kilogram in a museum, so that's the base unit here um, for mass. Um, there's also a volume standard that's measured in cubic meters instead of in liters. So um, we're basically going to stick to the ones in the middle. Um, the metric system, the idea is that these are the ones without prefixes. So if you notice here, the K is a prefix for gram. Um, the, uh, what we have is basically these are our, our base unit systems liter, meter, gram, and second and the temperature there's a different problem we'll spend some time on that one in a separate video but um, there are actually two different metric temperature scales one of them more comparable and used for weather in most of the world the way that we use the Fahrenheit scale the other more a description of energy and the scientific description in the scientific uses which is the Kelvin scale um, the difference between them is just what they consider to be the reference and again we'll come back to that in another video because it requires quite a bit of explanation but that's why there are two there all right so first one volume um, we can do two different ways of dealing with volume um, the first is if it's a liquid volume is relatively easy we have things like graduated cylinders where we can read them off directly so this slide shows you we're basically a uh, you know looking at a an amount on a graduated cylinder and you'll see more of this with your lab but the point is um, we can read a volume directly if we have a solid um, well obviously it's not going to fit in this most of the time so we have to work a little bit a little bit differently um, if it's a regular solid like a cube or a rectangular block something that's geometrically regular we can work out the volume using calculations um, based on based on length measurements so volume if you remember for something like a cube um, or something like a rectangular solid is you know length times width times height so we can measure those sides and multiply them and get volume um, if it's an irregular solid like a rock so if I've got something that doesn't have a regular shape there's no geometric formula for that the way that I can measure volume there is I can actually drop it into a liquid and see how much the liquid changes it's called volume by displacement so if I drop that rock into here and the volume changes by two milliliters then I know that the volume of the rock was actually two milliliters but it has to be something that the the solid has to be more dense than the liquid and you have to have accurate measurement of the volume of the liquid so we can get to volume a couple of different ways if liquid it's easy if it's a rectangular solid it's easy if it's an irregular solid okay we have to do a little bit more work for it but we can still do it all right so um, conversion factors we will talk about these um, but basically the one that you kind of want to keep in mind is that comparable a liter and a quart are very very close they're not exact but the point is you know if you're if you're kind of thinking just in your own consumer life when you're at the grocery store you'll see things in quarts and just you know off the top of your head now that you've listened to this lecture what's that in liters it's almost exactly the same so your quart of milk is basically a liter of milk it's a little bit off but it's basically the same um, so those are comparably used in each system um, we'll have similar relationships for the other measurable quantities that will have conversions that are close to one they're not going to be perfect like a meter and a yard are fairly close so those two are almost interchangeable um, but that's the one way of getting used to this is just having one reference to look at but okay so if I say a quart is almost a liter um, you know then that means a gallon is almost four liters 
right? So I can kind of use the references I know of my gallon of milk in the fridge and one unit that's very close to being one-to-one -to, -one to kind of get me a point of understanding. Okay. Um, length system. The, the meter is the standard, um, but that is not so easy to deal with. I mean, you're generally not going to measure most objects with meters. Those are, I mean, a meter is a little over three feet. So aside from your own height and things like distance, that's not really a great system of measure. We use a subdivision of that that's one one hundredth of that called a centimeter. That is the closest one to the English version, which is the inch. Um, a centimeter and an inch are about two and a half, uh, two and a half centimeters per inch. Um, we'll give you exact numbers for that, but that's the idea. So you can get, you know, kind of a, a, a an idea of, of things being comparable in those two scales. Um, this is the more exact version, 2.54 centimeters per inch. Um, and then here's the one that's almost identical, is the yard. The yard to a meter is almost identical, again. But we don't use the yard commonly, so converting to meters in our brain doesn't work quite as well. Um... All right, mass. Now, we're gonna talk more about tools and you'll get that out of the lab as well, but the idea here is that we have a system that is basically um, comparable, it's not even comparable to an ounce. A kilogram is the closest metric equivalent to a pound. Um, but we typically are dealing with smaller quantities than that, especially in a chemistry lab. So we're down to a gram and roughly a gram is roughly you know um, the way that I was taught it was a gram is somewhere close to the mass of a paper clip so it's it's very small but in chemistry lab work you know those are quantities we work with and that's enough we don't work in really large quantities because that requires big glassware lots of energy lots of chemicals we, we don't like to work on a big scale like that it's just expensive and, and if there's any safety hazard it also gets a lot bigger with the more you work with you know, you're not afraid of spilling small amounts of things. You know, think about spilling a glass of water versus, you know, spilling one of those five-gallon things from Poland Spring. It's a much bigger mess. So those aren't hazardous, but now add a hazard to that. So a small spill of a hazardous substance, not a big deal. A small, a, a larger spill of it, big problem. So we, we'd like to keep that down, and as much as we can in our in, in research labs, we do. But when we take chemistry out into the manufacturing scale where you know they're going to make tons of products to ship to stores to sell you well then you're talking about really large amounts of chemicals and really big hazards if something goes wrong um, so the the requirements safety wise are much more strict and the the the, the apparatus are much better engineered okay so mass um, Strangely, I learned this from a cereal box. Uh, I can't remember why I would know that, but, you know, I remember seeing this on a cereal box many, many years ago. It was like 454 grams per pound. Um, I think it was like Rice Krispies or something, but um, it's been stuck in my brain ever since. Um, but they're, they're, even those are not quite as exact. It's actually 453.6, or one kilogram is, is slightly over 2.2 pounds. Um, so if you want to feel better about yourself... Um, if you've put on your, uh, you know, quarantine 15, so to speak, um, you can feel better about that because in, in metric terms, it's, it's a quarantine five or quarantine six kilograms. So I haven't put on 15 pounds. I've put on six and change kilograms. I feel so much better. I'm not 200 pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm only, you know, 90 kilograms or so. So I don't have to admit that I'm fat and I should stop eating pizza twice a week. Okay. So, um, just keep that in mind that sometimes um, the relationships are not, we don't have a one to one here that makes any sense. We don't have anything close. You know, kilogram pounds are roughly two, uh, two apart. So we don't have a simple relationship that we can just sort of, sort of say, all right, well, these two are roughly equivalent. So the way we had with a liter and a quart, for instance. Okay, the temperature scale. Um, We'll do a separate video on that one because that is problematic, converting from one to the other. Now, if you have a thermometer like this, okay, you have both. Um, but 
the references are strange. If we go look at the Fahrenheit scale, the reference is very odd. Um, the Celsius scale is based off of freezing point of water, so that's what zero C is, is, is water freezes to ice. Um, why this Fahrenheit scale starts at 32 is something that I, I've never heard a great explanation for. It was like supposedly referenced off of seawater outside of the lab where it was measured or something. I don't know. It has to be really salty water before you get to zero on the Fahrenheit scale as a freezing point. Um, we'll, we'll address that in a different video, but there's, there's a reference difference there, and that's why that scale is offset and strange. Um, okay, time... Um, hopefully I don't have to explain this one. Hopefully everyone knows this. But, oddly, people do make dumb mistakes here. Um, because two of the conversions are exactly the same numerically. So 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to a minute. So if I ask someone to convert seconds to hours, sometimes they'll forget to do one of the 60s. So just be careful with that. And as we talk about unit conversions, I'll help you be really clear on that. But... It is something because these two conversions are exactly the same digits. It's easy to say, all right, I already did one of those. I don't have to do it again. When you do have to do it again, depending on the question. Okay. So, type of measurement we're doing here. Uh, temperature <laughs> kind of gives that one away. I don't know what we're measuring. Um, hmm, that's confusing to me. What, what, what could be the quantity we're dealing with measurement there? Uh, this is so hard. Okay. Um, anyway. Um, the others are a little less obviously given in the question. So, um, G is the abbreviation for grams. Um, that is a metric unit of mass. Uh, capital L is liters. That is the abbreviation for volume. And, of course, H is for hours. That's time. So, um, we'll talk about the abbreviations a little bit later, but the point is... Um, you need to kind of get a few of those in your brain early. So let's talk about those. Uh, the gram, the abbreviation is G. So um, the liter, the abbreviation is capital L. Now that's important because we'll use a lowercase l as we describe whether something is a liquid or a solid. So if I want to describe liquid water, for instance, this is the formula for water, and after it I would put the italics, lowercase l. That tells me it's a liquid. Whereas if I wanted to talk about ice, well, that's solid water, that's the S. So that L is capitalized for a reason. It's block printed capitalized. Um, next, of course, as you saw in that previous one, the Celsius scale is degree C. Um, time... So we've got the hour, which is just lowercase s. Well, let's try that again. We've got the hour, which is, of course, lowercase h. We've got the minute, which is not used as commonly, but lowercase m. And the second, which we do use quite often, as lowercase s. Um, and then for length, the meter is the lowercase m. Now, here's where we run into a problem. That's why I say minute doesn't get used very often. Frequently, to avoid problems here, um, we'll see the multi-letter abbreviation for minute. You don't need that for seconds and hours. There's nothing else that has those uh, a one-letter abbreviation you could confuse with those. But for meters and minutes, you do. So we got to be really careful if we go through minutes that we don't do anything silly with that. So these are the abbreviations. Um, as we go into the metric system more, we'll also have some prefixes that you have to get in your brain that we're going to use with those. Um, they are as follows. Um, kilo, um, lowercase k, and what that is is 10 to the third. So um, one kilogram, for instance, is 10 to the third grams. So this prefix means the same thing. So if I say I have one kilogram, that means I have 1,000 or 1 times 10 to the third grams. So that's what the prefixes use. The kilo is the only one that we use that's actually larger than the base unit. The others are all smaller, subdivisions. So 
there are basically five of them we need to know. And here they are. Kilo, as I said, is 10 to the third. As we go downward in divisions, we have centi, which we use for length in a centimeter. This is 1 one hundredth, so 10 to the minus 2, 1 divided by 100. So 1 centimeter is 1 one hundredth of a meter. There are 100 centimeters in 1 meter. Um, milli we use more commonly for volume, but also for smaller distances. Um, this is 10 to the minus 3, so like milligrams of, of drugs, um, milliliters of volume, and, and millimeters are really small length. Below that, hard to measure, but much more useful for other sciences like biology, um, micro, where we're getting down to a ridiculously small scale, 10 to the minus 6th. Um, this is how you're measuring out, like DNA for experiments. You're dealing with micrograms at that point. Um, you said really tiny quantities. And then the tiniest of scales that we deal with regularly is nano, which is 10 to the minus 9. So we'll deal with all of these, but when we use an abbreviation, um, we can replace it with these numbers. So if I have 1 kilogram, as I did in the previous one, that means I can replace that K with 10 to the 3rd. So I can just say that's 1 times 10 to the third grams. But the other thing I wanted to point out here is that the abbreviations are run together. So the abbreviations for these are um, lowercase k for kilo, um, lowercase c, lowercase m. Now with micro we have a problem because we've already used m. So what we do instead is use a lowercase greek m called mu. So it's kind of a weird italics looking thing. Um, and then nano, of course, is lowercase n. So if I have one centimeter, it's just the abbreviations are moved together. So this is, you know, these letters don't have a space between them. One, the C, the M, and that is one times 10 to the minus two meters. If I have one milliliter, that is one times 10 to the minus three liters. If I have one microgram, and sometimes you'll see this type just as a U because it, if you don't have symbol font, you can't write this out. Um, so sometimes it'll, sometimes you'll see it written as one M one U G. Um, I don't I don't like that very much, but you deal with what you have in terms of font. So if I have one microgram, well then that is uh, one times ten to the minus six grams. And if I'm dealing with one nanometer. This is down to the scale of the atom that we're going to talk about shortly. This is a 10 to the minus 9 meters. So it's a very, very tiny quantity. All right, so these are the metric prefixes and the abbreviations that go with them and how we substitute them out. We're going to use this a lot. So you want to get these in your brain. These five you have to know. There are others. Your book may list off a whole bunch more of them. Um, we don't use them commonly. So... I'm not going to make you work with them. These are the ones we work with all the time. You have to know these five. Um, so cram them into your brain, and you're going to get a lot of practice with them.